So I'm really thrilled to have all of you come uh, here about uh, research on cell movements. And I just want to get to know my audience a little bit here. So how many of you are in the 12th grade? You can raise your hand. There are a few up there. How many in the 11th grade? You, 10th grade, more, 9th grade, there we go, 8th grade, wow, a lot of those, 7th grade, wow, 6th grade, wow, 5th grade, this is quite a group here, 4th grade, wow, we have some 4th graders here too, well, I'm in the 70th grade. <laughs> I started, I started kindergarten 70 years ago, and it was so much fun. I'm still going to classes and reading and learning and, and having a lot of fun. And hopefully you'll have a, a, a lot of fun during your life staying uh, in tune with exciting things in science and other fields. So today I'm going to talk about cells and how they move over here. So let me tell you how I got started on this. So uh, when I was in high school, uh, we had a demonstration in our biology class of an amoeba, this very kind of an amoeba. It's pretty darn big as cells go. This is one millimeter across here, so you could just barely see this thing with the naked eye. And they move beautifully, as you can see in this movie. You can see that the, the cytoplasm, the interior of the cell, is flowing toward the front here and pushing these protrusions at the front, which are called uh, pseudopods. I'm going to stay away from most of the fancy names we have for things in biology, but pushing forward the front of the cell. And I thought this was really cool. And, uh, whoops, back up. And so having seen this in biology class, I was curious about what was going on. And it turned out that nothing was known about the molecules that made the cell move. Zero when I was in high school. So then I went on to uh, college and then and medical school. And uh, while I was there, I learned about other kinds of cells that move, including cells in our own body. So this uh, cell right here is a, called a white blood cell. These other cells, the round ones, are called red blood cells. That's what makes your blood red, carries the oxygen in your blood. You probably know that. And what these white blood cells are doing are looking for bacteria that might have gotten into your body through a cut or a wound and they're gobbling them up and removing them and protecting us all from bacterial infections. So let's take a look at this cell moving. Uh, so it's, it's got a, a big name over here, which we won't worry about, but this is the white blood cell. <clears throat> and these are red blood cells over here that carry the oxygen in the blood. And there's the little bacteria over there. Now the, the object is that this white blood cell has to try to catch the bacteria, but it's getting pushed around here. So it has to navigate very precisely to keep up with that little bacteria wherever it's going. And uh, whoops, it made a wrong turn there. It turns back to the north. And eventually, right over here, it catches up with it and takes it inside and, and, and breaks it down. And that's what protects you from infections. So this is very cool. Uh, but uh, even when I was in college, whoops. Even when I was in college, we still knew nothing about the molecules that make, uh, make cells like this move. In medical school, I read a paper by some English scientists who claimed you could take the guts out of a cell, the cytoplasm, and look at it in a microscope, and they claimed it would move around outside of the living cell. Uh, that was pretty amazing, uh, and it turned out that uh, other scientists were unable to per reproduce this result, so people didn't actually believe this. But I said, if that's true, this would be a great way to study how cells move, so I set out to reproduce this experiment when I was a medical student. It took me 11 tries to get it to work. Each one took about a week. But finally, on the 11th try, I got it to work, and then it worked every time after that. So these guys were right. So I want to show you what uh, we did. So this is the, the guts of the cell, the cytoplasm over here, the little particles that are in, normally in the cytoplasm of the cell. This is the membrane that would normally be around the cell, but we broke the cell open. And so I'll start up this movie, and you can see what happens if you look uh, sharply. The little particles are sort of jiggling around. 
like they would in a, uh, particles in a, in a glass of water. This is the membrane over here, so we could remove the membranes like that. Now we just have the guts of the cell, the cytoplasm. And if you look at it, uh, there's some jiggling around, but it's really not very impressive. And if this is all the time that the other scientists looked at this, it's no wonder they thought it didn't work. But we were patient, and uh, after a while, you could start seeing uh, things happen that couldn't just happen by the uh, thermal motion in the samples, so like the whole specimen's moving around here on the slide. This is exciting. You had to run out in the hall and grab somebody to come in and look at this, because this was amazing, because this is outside the cell. Look at all these fantastic movie, movements. <clears throat> and they get even more elaborate here. Then I took these specimens and I looked up at them in a very powerful microscope called an electron microscope. And I observed that they contained lots of filaments, which you can see. There are little lines here, and there are more little lines here and there. And there were some thicker filaments as well. And that, of course, reminded us of the kind of thing you see in muscle, which is the, was the best characterized uh, system of movement that we knew about at the time. And in muscle, there are some thick filaments and thin filaments. So we thought, wow, maybe amoebas and human white blood cells are moving around using the same molecules as muscle. So one day, the department chairman over here came in to see me. <clears throat> he was a very nice fellow and was very supportive in my career. But he looked at my pictures and he said, nice micrographs. But do you really believe that amoebas have actin and myosin like muscle and sort of laughed? And left the room, okay? This was very intimidating, I must say, <clears throat> uh, because just like everybody else, nobody believed that this, would, this could be possible. But it turned out that was the explanation for how cells move. And so now I've got a question for you. If you had done these experiments, how would you make progress in trying to understand the machinery that actually makes the cell move? If you wanted to set up your lab at this point, what kind of questions would you ask? Here's my first answer. So I mean, that, the questions you would ask would be like, um, how is this happening? And, and how are you going to get to it? And what you want to get to it? Yeah, you ask exactly the right question. That is, how does it work? OK, that would be the big question. But let's say you set out to find out how it worked. And you didn't know anything about how it worked. What, what, what were some of the things you might go hunting for? What would you try to find? Anybody else? That was a good answer. Let's see if somebody else can help me out here. Well, if you had a watch and you were trying to figure out how an old-fashioned watch you know, works, you'd probably look inside that watch and, and take a look at all the parts. OK? So that would be the first thing on my list, to find the parts that make the system work. And then what would be the next thing if you had all the parts of a watch? What would you do? See how they all come together? Exactly. OK. The second thing on the list would be to find out how all the parts interact with each other. And then you could do some experiments. For example, you could put your watch back together, your clock back together, and leave out one of the parts and see what happened. And maybe it wouldn't work so well. Or you could try to come up with a, a, a theory, a mathematical theory for how it worked. And we do all, actually all those things in biology. So you did a great job. You, you, were, you would have been on the right track here. So let me show you a little diagram of how this works. <clears throat> so this is a strategy that people use, have been using for about 100 years to figure out how things work in biology. <clears throat> and the first thing is you need a good biological question. So you guys know my biological question is, how does the cell move? Second thing, which you guys figured out, you have to find the molecules, the, the, the parts that make the cell move. OK? And then there are three different kinds of experiments you can do. One involves physics, and that is to determine the structure of all of the molecules. And what you really want to know is where all the atoms in these molecules are uh, located. And so that requires some physical methods. Just like your clock you took apart, you'd, you'd want to understand the size and shape of all the parts in the clock. 
Second thing is to do some chemistry over here on the right. That is to characterize, as you've correctly pointed out, you've got to figure out how all the parts are interacting with each other, and you can do chemistry experiments to uh, understand that. And then, of course, you want to look in the cell to find out what the molecules are doing in the cell. And uh, when I first started doing this work uh, 50 years ago, um, we didn't have any way of doing that. But I'm going to show you a way that we can follow the individual parts of the machine inside of a living cell. And if you have these three things, structures of the molecules, something, information about interactions, and a understanding of how they're moving around in the cell, then you can come up with an idea about what's going on. And a way of testing your idea is to make a mathematical model to test your ideas with a computer simulation. And you, so you run your computer simulation here and look to see what, whether you could reproduce what you see in the cell. Now what usually happens, and I'll illustrate that in my talk, is that your computer simulation doesn't work. Okay, there's something wrong. And then that, is, that means you've really made some progress. That tells you you're missing something. And you have to go looking to find out what's missing. So you can go up here and find some more molecules or do some more chemistry and make better mathematical models. And, and you go around this loop here, hopefully getting closer and closer over time to a correct description of how the whole thing works. So that's the big strategy that people use in biology. There's a little physics, a little chemistry, a little math, a little computer science. And at the end of the day, hopefully we have an understanding of how things work. Does that make sense to everybody? A little louder, oh goodness. I'll try. I've got the sound system turned up high, but <clears throat> I don't have a strong voice. Okay, so we have to find some molecules, and the, the most important molecule in our system that I'm talking about here is a protein called actin over here. Um, I won't go into the, any of the details, but the structure is based on physics research where we could figure out where all the atoms are in this protein. This is said to be the second most abundant protein on the Earth. It's probably the second or third most abundant protein in your body. And um, what it does is it spontaneously assembles into uh, filaments. And so the next slide shows a growing actin filament. This is a uh, filament over here. We're looking at it in a uh, microscope, a light microscope, where we can make movies, and we're going to add some more actin molecules and see what happens. Now look close and I'll ask you what you see. So this is speeded up a little bit, and you can see the filament growing, and uh, over time some more filaments are dropping onto the surface of the microscope slide. But which end is growing faster, the green end or the red end? Green. The green end. So that one end grows much faster than the other. So why is that? Well, we did a lot of, uh, of uh, biochemistry experiments, and we measured the rates of a lot of reactions. Uh, and the reactions over on this end, which is the green end, are much faster than the reactions over on the other end, which is the red end. And that explains why the filaments grow fast in one direction and slowly in the other direction. Okay, and those numbers, there's uh, quite a few numbers up there. There are 10 numbers up there which describe the rates of all the chemical reactions, and those numbers are the foundation for everything we uh, know about how the system works. I'm not going to tell you anything about these numbers, but I just want you to understand that having these numbers is give you some really fundamental information about this, how the system works. And it would be built into all the mathematical models. Now, <clears throat> if you just had some of those actin molecules in a test tube and you added the kind of salt that you find in, in cells, those filaments would all polymerize in a few seconds into a big tangled mass. And they wouldn't do anything. So the cell has to control this polymerization reaction. And to do so, there are over 50 different kinds of proteins in cells that regulate each step in the assembly of these uh, filaments. Uh, here we can see a filament, and you can see actin subunits can add to the two ends. 
There are some proteins that block one of the ends over here. There are other proteins like this blue one that cross link the filaments into a network so there's, the network is stiff. Uh, there are other proteins that break the actin filaments up into little bits and many more. And this uh, combination of proteins and cells makes sure that the filaments polymerize only where the cell needs to move forward. Now, the, one of these uh, proteins down here, this green one, called the ARP23 complex, uh, discovered by one of my students uh, 25 years ago, uh, is really important for the system because it allows these filaments to make branches. So let's take a look at that. So here is the structure of that ARP23 complex. You can see there are seven different colors because there are seven different proteins making up this, this uh, structure. Two of these proteins, the or orange one and the red one, are similar to actin, and it turns out that they are the first two molecules in the branch that's going to grow off the existing filament. This is a little uh, 3D uh, representation of the complex here. You can see all the pretty colors. The blue subunits are holding the two actin-related proteins uh, together over here. And uh, there are some other subunits that help it attach to the side of an actin filament. So let's see what happens if we take some of those actin filaments that you already saw growing in the light micro, uh, micro, microscope. Here they are. There's one. There's another one over there and there. And now we're going to add some ARP23 complex and actin molecules and see what happens. What do you think is going to happen? We're going to get branches. OK, good. Here we go. We'll see whether you're right. Look at that. So you can actually see the branches forming right before your eyes by taking the purified molecules and putting them together to reproduce these reactions that take place in the cell. <clears throat> That's a very important strategy that uh, people use in biology is to find the molecules and then put them together and get them to reproduce something that they've observed in a cell. OK, so that's part of this overall strategy. So th this is speeded up so it, we don't have to sit here all morning to watch it. But now we want to take a look at these molecules in a cell. That's a little more complicated. And as I said, when I got started, there was no way to do this. But uh, fortunately, uh, in the last 20 years, methods have been developed to put some uh, little beacons, I'll call them, on the protein molecules and cells. These little beacons glow in the dark. So you can actually see where they are in the cell. And if they're attached to the protein you're interested in, then you can follow it around inside the cell. So this is amazing. So I'm going to show you a little uh, so-called molecular biology about how you do this. So this is a piece of DNA here, just a little teeny tiny piece of the DNA you might have in your cells. And the red thing here is, our, is the piece of DNA that's going to um, determine the structure of the protein that you're interested in, OK? And then here's another little piece of DNA over here on the right that doesn't have anything to do with your protein. Now what we want to do is attach this little glow-in-the-dark protein to the red protein. So what you do is, uh, in the lab, you make a piece of DNA that's got a little piece of the red uh, gene up here and a little piece of the blue gene up here. And in between, you put your, the code for the protein that glows in the dark, which is called GFP. OK? And then uh, something miraculous happens. You put this into the cell. And this little piece of DNA gets inserted into the gene up here. So now you've got the green glow-in-the-dark protein. I think there's some seats up there. You guys want to go find a seat? There's two seats right there. OK, they seem to be happy. OK, now, now we've got our red protein of interest with this little green glow-in-the-dark protein attached to one end. So that's super fantastic. So now we can look in the cell and uh, or we can label up a certain protein. So here's the ARP23 complex again. And we can put, put for example, this glow-in-the-dark protein on one of these subunits, the gold one in this case. OK? Now, 
we can uh, look in the cell and see where that glow-in-the-dark protein is located, and that'll tell us where the ARP23 complex is. <clears throat> so here is a pair of micrographs of the same cell. Uh, this is a, just a regular micrograph of the cell. You can see the edge of the cell right here. And this is a uh, micrograph showing where the glowing protein is located. It's a little bright in this room. I don't know if you have any control over that. Let's see. <laughs> I'll no, I can't tell what's going to happen. Well, here we go. Oh, that's way too bright. I made it worse. Oh my gosh, this was really dangerous. <laughs> well, okay, now you can see better, but you're in the dark. I'm sorry. Okay, so here we've got our, this happens to be a cancer cell over here. And here you can see the glow in the dark picture. And you, what you see is right around the edge of the cell, there's a bright region. And that shows you where the ARP23 complex is located in the cell. This is actually a movie. So we can play this movie, which is speeded up 150 times. And you can see that our protein of interest, the ARP23 complex, stays right at the leading edge of the cell as the cell is moving along. I never thought in my life I'd ever see anything like this. This is like a dream come true. You can follow your molecules around inside of a living cell. Now you can also look at these cells in the electron microscope and the light microscope. Up at the top are some uh, pictures taken in a light microscope. They're taken at five second intervals. So the cell started out here and then it moved there and there and there over a period of about 20 seconds. You can see it's moving up here toward the upper right. Uh, this is a picture showing where the actin molecules are located in the cell. They're yellow. And uh, then it's possible to prepare these cells uh, where you've taken off the cell membrane and you can look inside the cell in an electron microscope. And in this part of the cell up at the very front, you can see this fantastic array of filaments. Those are each one of these, uh, an actin filament, like the ones you've been learning about so far. And uh, what was discovered by uh, our friends about 20 years ago was that these filaments right up at the leading edge of the cell are all part of a branch network. And the ARP23 complex, is which is located there, is responsible for making all these branches. So let's think about what, what must be happening here. These little filaments are growing, and somehow they're pushing the cell forward. So here is a cartoon coming up. Uh, proposing how these branching, growing actin filaments can make the cell move. There's a lot of stuff on this diagram, but let's just focus at the top part of the diagram. This gray box up here shows the membrane around the cell. So that's, that's what's getting pushed. And in the cytoplasm, as you just saw from the electron micrographs, there's some uh, uh, network of these actin filaments, and they're all part of a branch network. And what happens is that the green thing, which is the ARP23 complex, lands on an old actin filament and starts up a new branch which grows. And as the actin molecules add to the tip of that filament, they actually produce force. They produce a lot of force as they're growing. And they push against the inside of the membrane. So let me give you an analogy for how this would work. So imagine a bush, a bush in the springtime, and of course it's got some branches on it already, but in the springtime, what happens? New branches start forming off of every one of the branches in the, book, the bush, and if you put a net over the top of the bush, what would happen to the net in the springtime as the uh, new branches were forming? What's that? Well, push against the net. Okay, so you've got this bush with all these little twigs that are growing, and what would happen? It would push on the net. That's exactly what happens in your cells. So, for example, this process is responsible for connecting all the cells in your brain. By growing out uh, the, the front end of the nerve cells until they find where they're going. And in your brain, you have one million miles of these connections that have all been produced by these chemical reactions. 
So how about that? Your whole computer got wired up by polymerizing filaments, which are going to push the front end of the cell around until it finds out where it should be connected. How about that? Now, how could you test this? Well, one thing you could do would be to remove one piece at a time. As I said, we could do with our clock example earlier. So you could remove one of these proteins, like you could remove the green ARP23 complex and see what happens. So what do you suppose happens if you remove the ARP23 complex? Anybody? It stops branching. I'm sure everybody else thought of the same thing. OK, thank you for answering, though. It stops branching. And what does this do? This really slows down cell movements, because the branching is what's producing new generations of filaments that are actually producing the force to make the cell move. Or you could remove any one of the other of these proteins and find the consequences. And I assure you that every one of them on this cartoon is important, and something bad happens if you remove any one of these proteins. So that's one test. So another test you could do would be to uh, run a computer simulation of this. And that's actually, in some ways, the best test. Because it's impossible, I'll get to you in just a second, it's impossible. It's impossible for the human mind, even somebody who knows a lot about this, to really understand how this thing works. You just, your brain isn't good enough to figure out how it would actually work and whether your ideas are correct. But you can test your ideas by making a mathematical model and, and running a simulation in a computer and see whether it comes out the way you think. Yes? So different proteins can speed up or slow down like cell movement? Or yeah. Okay. Yeah, he, he asked whether the different proteins can speed up or slow down the cell movements. Now, all of these contribute here to, the, to speeding things up. And so if you get rid of any one of them, it slows it down. OK? Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's a little indirect. I didn't show you the details, but these little uh, the little molecules in the filaments have to recycle like this. So if you slow down the recycling, you run out of molecules to make the filaments grow and things slow down, for example. How do you say the white blood cells know where on the cell to make the branches so okay. that they can Great move question. In the direction they want? And Thank you. This uh, a woman wants to know how the cell knows where to go. And I didn't explain that, but now that you ask, it happens to be on this diagram. Up here, this blue thing is a molecule in the membrane of the cell that uh, can react with, for example, molecules that are coming from the bacteria. And if it reacts with the molecules coming from the bacteria, it actually sets up a whole pathway that promotes the formation of these branches. And we know each of the reactions along that pathway. OK? And that's how the thing steers. It's, uh, the cell is looking for chemical signals coming from the environment. And it steers in the direction of things that it likes. And it runs away from things that it doesn't like by interactions with these molecules in the membrane. Everybody get that? That was a great question. Uh, many, many of my friends have spent years figuring out the answer to that question, which I could give you in 30 seconds. <clears throat> OK, let's, let's look at a mathematical model. Now, to make a mathematical model, you need uh, some biochemical and biophysical information. You need to make some measurements on live cells. And you saw how to do that now. And then you can take that information and make a mathematical model. You just write down all the reactions that you think are responsible for the activity you're observing. And then you use a computer to uh, simulate the process. And uh, this is a, a, actually the first mathematical model of cell movement that actually worked by some of my friends. And this is an outline of the cell over here. And inside this imaginary cell, they put all those reactions I had on the previous slide and used the concentrations we measured in cells and the rates of the reactions we measured in the test tube. And um, just turned on all the reactions to see what would happen. Now the cell actually moves. This imaginary cell actually moves. Uh, and if, we, if they just let it go, it would run off the slide. So what they've done is kept the cell in one place, and they're going to move the, the background so that the, uh, you can see it moving by looking at the background moving. So here we go. This is very cool. So here's our imaginary cell moving along. You can see it's moving. And it turns out that the mathematical model produces enough force to move the cell at exactly the rate that's observed with live cells in the lab. 
So this is truly amazing. You do all this biochemistry and physics and math, and the darn thing works. This is great. OK, so that's this, this full strategy where you start out where you find molecules, you characterize the individual molecules, make measurements in cells, and then you put them all back together and see whether your machine actually works. And in this case, it worked great. So any questions about this before I go on to something else? I hope you're somewhat amazed that uh, you can use chemistry and physics and math to understand some complicated biological process. Yes? Why are they moving? That's, that's, the, that's the, uh, the, the, the floor. It's like the floor that the cell is sitting on. The cell is actually moving in this uh, simulation. But in order that it doesn't run off the slide, they've let the, the floor move. The, the, the floor is moving so that we can keep the cell in the middle of the picture. OK, yeah. So the protein's on the back of the cell then um, get a signal to break the pressure? Yeah, yeah. Break the oh, that's a great question. She wants to know how, how you take this whole thing apart. And it turns out it automatically disassembles itself. You make the filaments and branches, but then the, the actin filaments have a little timer built into them, so they automatically age and automatically disassemble pretty fast, in about 10 seconds. So they push, and then they go away, and then you use all, of that, all those molecules to make new filaments to, to move the next distance. Can you explain why some of the, the numbers on the x-axis are negative? Yeah. Oh, I don't know. This is just the coordinate system in their computer simulation. I, I, I was afraid this was going to be a little confusing. Hopefully you got the idea that the cell is moving in the background which would normally be stationary, has to be moved so you can keep your eye on the cell. OK, those are good questions. Let me tell you about something else in the time we have left. The timing time's good. And that's, that's about how cells divide. This is a, another very fundamental type of cell movements. So, um, whoops. So each of you started out as an egg cell from mom and a sperm cell from dad, and they got together to make a one-cell uh, embryo. And then after that, the cell divided in two. And then you were a two-cell embryo. And then you, then those, all those cells divided in two again. And then you were a four-cell embryo. And uh, if you just keep on repeating this, 38 times, what do you get? A kid. <laughs> OK? So that's, that kid's got a trillion cells in it. Uh, do you have any idea how big a trillion is? You know, if you started counting right now, one, two, three, four, and so on, how long would it take you to count to a trillion? It would take over. A, do you know? Oh, much more than your life. Much more than your life. Getting, getting to, uh, getting to a, a, a billion would take you most of your life. OK, so this would take uh, you know, many decades. It depends on how fast you speak and how fast. How fast you speak. <laughs> if you went really fast, if you went really fast, you might get up to a few billion. But you wouldn't get to a trillion in your lifetime. OK, so I'm just I'm telling you this because Trillion's a big number, but it only takes 38 rounds of cell division to get a trillion cells to make a human being. How about that? OK, so how does this work? This is another kind of cell movement. And uh, here we have uh, an example of an egg cell. It happens to be from a sea urchin, but your cells would look about the same. And in this movie, you'll have a chance to see the cell going through the first round of cell division like that. So I saw that when I was in high school, too, and I thought that was really cool. <clears throat> and, uh, <clears throat> and, uh, but nothing was known about this either. Nobody knew any of the molecules that were responsible for this amazing event. So by the time I was a junior faculty member in the 1970s, uh, one of my friends discovered there was a band of action filaments, which are our usual yellow color here. So you're familiar with that. And we discovered that there were motor proteins in this band of actin filaments, and that they together uh, were likely to be responsible for the 
formation of that cleavage furrow, which you saw over there. So here are the actin filaments, and here are the motors. So now I'm going to attempt to turn the lights back on here so I can explain about motors. Something's happening. That's not quite enough. Okay, great. Now I have a volunteer right here, right here, who's going to help me explain about motors. And I want to thank her very much. What's your name? Latoya. Latoya. Okay, she's going to help me explain about motors. So hang on to that. We're going to play tug of war here. So she, she's, she's anchored over there someplace, and uh, I'm, and this is an actin filament. It's red this time instead of yellow. And it's also much floppier than it really is. Uh, the, it's actually uh, about as stiff as steel, uh, so it wouldn't be flopping like this. But I'm going to demonstrate what a motor can do. And I'm the motor. My hands are the motor. And what the motor does is grab onto the actin filaments, and it pulls, and it pulls, and it pulls. And if I pull hard enough, I can move you, I think. There you go. Okay. So that's how these motor proteins work. And I won't go into any more details of how they work. They burn some chemical fuel, uh, and they produce forces on the filaments. So the idea here is that these motor pro thank you, these motor proteins. Uh, sorry about turning the lights off again here. Whoops, there we go. But I think we're going to need you. The motor proteins are pulling on the uh, the actin filaments, which are attached to the membrane, and that's going to pull on the membrane to make the cleavage furrow. Just to remind you, let me show you the cleavage furrow happening over here again. <clears throat> okay, now that you know there's a bundle of filaments around the equator of the cell there, and there are motors pulling on them, you can imagine how that would cause the cell to change shape. Okay, now you can do all the same things. And in this, uh, you've got to find the molecules, you've got to do some biochemistry and biophysics. And in this case, it was very tough to find the molecules. In the case of cell motility, there is only about a dozen really important proteins. And biochemists, like ourselves, found all of those proteins by doing biochemistry experiments. In this case, it was really hard to find all the molecules because there are more than 10 times more protein molecules involved with cell division than with cell motility. You never would have guessed that because this looks simpler than cell motility. And so who found the molecules? It was people doing genetics. Genetics, making damage to the genes and finding out which of those damaged genes were required for the cell to divide in two. And the best organism for doing that were these little yeast cells, which you can see here. They're shaped like, I'll get you in a second. They're shaped like little uh, sausages, like a little hot dog. And they're beautiful for, for doing genetics experiments. And other people in the field found more than 150 genes, and therefore more than 150 proteins are required for cell movements. I had a question over here. You still have a question? Um, well, I was going to ask um, the last slide that you were showing, what stage of cell division was that represented? That's a stage called cytokinesis. OK, I'm trying to leave out all the big words, but maybe you've heard that word someplace. <laughs> OK. Yeah, you heard about that last year. OK, you guys are cool. There's some younger kids here who wouldn't know what that meant, so I left that out, OK? I'm trying to avoid the big words. OK, so, uh, so the geneticists found the molecules, and biochemists and biophysicists studied the structure of the molecules and how they interact with each other, the usual things. And then we wanted to follow these molecules around in living cells. So uh, we could attach our glow-in-the-dark protein over here to the end of one of our molecules. This happens to be the motor that's going to pull on the actin filaments. And we can look in the cell and find out where it's located. And for most of the life of the cell, it's spread throughout the cytoplasm, as in these three cells, which I'm circling here. In some cells, you can see that there are the, uh, oh, I should point something out here. I was just about to take for granted. In all the previous pictures, the glow-in-the-dark protein showed up white against a black background. In this picture, I'm sorry, we've reversed the thing so that the glow-in-the-dark proteins are black here against a white background, OK? So at a certain stage in the life of the cell, then the, the, about half of the black protein ends up in these little spots, which we call nodes, and then the nodes form a band like this. And there's a beautifully formed mature band. 
And after a little delay, the band starts to constrict and it gets smaller and smaller and then all the protein goes back in the cytoplasm of the cell for the rest of the uh, cell cycle. So this is a movie. Uh, it's speeded up about 800 times, so we won't be here all night looking at this thing. And it's, uh, it corresponds to about three hours in the life of these cells. So take a look at these two cells right there. They're very nice. As we turn on the movie, and you can see these events playing out. First there are nodes, then there's a beautiful ring, the ring constricts, and then the protein goes back in the cytoplasm. So nodes, ring, constriction, back in the cytoplasm. Everybody see that? And every single cell is doing the same thing, but they do it at different times. They're not all synchronized. So if you look at any one of these cells, they're gonna go through the same process. Diffuse distribution, nodes, rings, constriction, back in the cytoplasm. So we use movies like this to figure out the timing of the events. And in the middle you can see cartoons. Here are some nodes in red. There's a ring in red. And then you can see the ring constricting, just like you saw in the movie. Does that look like a movie? Okay, good. And here's the timing. These nodes show up about an hour before the ring forms. And then the ring forms and constricts over about a period of another hour. So the whole thing takes about two hours in the life of the cell. And then we used our glow-in-the-dark proteins to find out when our favorite proteins that we knew were responsible for this process showed up at the scene of the crime. And over here on the right is a, a diagram showing when the different proteins show up. For example, the actin filaments show up uh, here at about time zero. The motor protein actually shows up before the, the uh, actin. And they get together in this ring. There's a delay while the ring matures, and then the ring constricts over here. So now we knew sort of the, the, uh, the rules the, that the, the cell is following. We know the molecules that are involved with the process. Let's see whether we can figure out how this thing actually works, which is the question you guys ask at the beginning. So we set out to learn enough about each one of these steps, like that arrow right there. It's the formation of the a ring by the nodes converting into a ring. So we took a close look at that, and we'll take a close look at it here. So we had this idea based on the properties of the protein molecules about how this worked. So this is a little sketch of what a node looks like from the top. Here's another, another, and another. And here's a, a view of a node from the side. These long skinny things are the motors. There, one end is attached to the inside of the cell membrane, right over here, and the other end is dangling down in the, in the cytoplasm of the cell. There's a little, uh, little pink protein in here, and it grows actin filaments. They grow off to the side. They don't have any idea where they're going. They just grow. And if they have... So there's an elongating actin filament up there. And if it happens to get close to another node, then the motors over here are gonna bind onto it. And then they're gonna to try to walk along that actin filament, just like we were doing in our demonstration, okay? And uh, the idea was that uh, the motors would pull on the filaments and maybe they would just pull all the nodes together to make a nice ring. So that sounds like a cool idea. The reviewers of our paper thought that was a great idea. The only trouble is that it doesn't actually work. So how did we find out that it didn't actually work? Well, we do our usual thing, make a mathematical model and run a computer simulation. So here's the model. There's one node growing two actin filaments. We know there's two of those pink things in there growing actin filaments. And this one happened to get close to another node, so it gets captured over here. And then the motors produce force, that's F, force, pulling like we did in our demo here. And so uh, we uh, did a simulation of that. Here's the uh, middle of the cell here, and we're gonna open it up. So here, here's the middle of the cell. We're gonna open it up like that. So in this picture here, you're looking at the inside of the cell membrane, and, and there's about 70 little red dots. Those are the little nodes. And they're growing green actin filaments, which you can just barely see here. So then we run this in a computer to see what happens. And we wonder, how's it gonna turn out? So here's what happened. Over a period of 10 minutes, 600 seconds, we don't get a beautiful contractile ring. What happens is we get ugly clumps of nodes, okay? 
see them. Look at them over here. They're big clumps of nodes. What you want is a nice continuous ring. So this is bad. So, but that told us we're missing something. So we've got to go back and find out what we're missing. So we have got to go back and take a closer look at the cell. So we had made better uh, micrographs. And here is a uh, 3D reconstruction of a cell turning around. You can see all those nodes there. In the middle, you can see a movie. Now the glow-in-the-dark proteins are white. You can see the motor protein accumulating in these nodes over time. It's speeded up 15-fold. And before the actin filaments start to polymerize, they don't move. They just sit there. But after the actin filaments start to polymerize, then, fantastically, the nodes start moving around. But they don't just collapse into a ring. Instead, they're going in every which direction, sometimes in the wrong direction. Uh, and they don't move continuously. They start and stop. And this start and stop movement was our clue to understanding what we were missing. Now, it seems to take a long time, but eventually all these nodes are going to end up in this band, which is part of the ring. So I'll be patient here and let the last few ones get there. And eventually, every single cell makes a perfect ring, as you can see right there. OK, so we had to add something to our mathematical model. And here it is. And that is that the connections between the nodes break. And they break about every 20 seconds. And we discovered the and characterized the protein that makes the breaks. And we, if we add that reaction to our simulation, uh, we have another simulation at the bottom here. This is the equator of the cell. We're going to open it up like that. So once again, we're looking at the inside of the membrane in the cell in the computer. This is connected to that over there. And we're going to turn on these reactions up here. Keep your eye on that node right there. It does great things. And when we turn on the reactions, you can see that the node moves in this direction. But then it stops right there because the connections got broken. But then it moved there. The connections got broken again. And then eventually it gets reconnected and it goes in this little cluster. And if you run the computer simulations like this, which is pretty fast, you can do this in a few minutes in your computer, this extremely simple model up at the top here makes a perfect contractile ring every single time. It never fails. And even more amazing, it makes it in the amount of time that the cell takes to make a contractile ring. So this gives us confidence that we're on the right track. We can also look at the constriction of the contractile ring down here. This is what we see in the cell. We can make a model of that that has actin filaments, which are gray up here, and the motors are shown in orange. And here's a simulation of that. Once again, the orange are the motors, and the blues are the anchors for the actin filaments. You can see that the actin filaments are growing. Some of them go off to the side, and they're useless. But a few of them get captured by the motors here. And that's this line of gray and green down the middle. And the simulation showed, amazingly enough, that this structure assembles itself. You don't need to have a little engineer in there telling it what the, the molecules what to do. You just put them in the right place, turn on their activities, and they assemble a contractile ring. Perhaps even more amazing, this uh, co computed contractile ring here produces the same amount of force that we measured in cells. So once again, although these are very complicated processes involving thousands of molecules, there's 200,000 actin molecules in this ring, 15,000 motor proteins. The simulations show that our very simple hypothesis for how it works actually reproduces what we see in live cells. So as I've described here, in both of my examples of cell motility and cell division, you do some biochemistry and biophysics and make some quantitative measurements in cells, come up with a mathematical model, and simulate that in a computer to find out whether your ideas are correct or false. I showed you examples in both cases uh, uh, where our ideas were not correct and where the computer simulation showed us we were wrong, but showed us how to move forward to get closer to the truth. And this is the example I showed you for, um, for uh, cell division. Now, so why is this important uh, for all of you in the audience here? Uh, 
So uh, one reason is that cancer is a, 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 a very uh, scary disease. I had it when I was 45 years old, so thank goodness here I am 30 years later. And uh, it's scary because uh, what happens is that the cell division uh, gets out of control. So damage to genes ca uh, controlling cell division allow the cancer cells to grow inappropriately. So this is a picture of some normal tissue down here sitting next to a tumor up here in the upper left. So those cells in the upper left are growing inappropriately. <clears throat> Second thing is uh, that the tumor cells can crawl out of the primary tumor and go to other parts of the body, like the lungs or the brain or some other part of the body and get, cause lots of trouble, which is actually what causes most of the, the uh, problems in cancer. Now, to understand something like cancer, uh, we have to understand the basic processes involved. And the limiting factor in dealing with cancer and every other human disease is uh, knowledge about the basic biology. So that's why people like me do basic biology. Some of my colleagues are here in the audience who are also professors of biology who do basic biology as well. So uh, this is a little take home message for everybody. Um, basic science matters because uh, we have to understand the basic processes in our body to understand the molecular basis of uh, disease. You might wonder whether we are actually prepared to answer these questions, and we weren't when I was a student 50 years ago, but we are now. I'm totally confident that uh, the biology community has an, enough uh, appropriate methods that we can solve any problem. We can understand any problem in biology, including cancer and any other disease. The limiting factor is the amount of uh, money that society is willing to invest in getting the answers. So if society is willing to invest the amount of money that we're investing now, uh, we'll get the answers in decades. Uh, if society decides not to spend so much money, and I must say the current administration is in favor of spending less money on this, uh, then we'll get the answer later and more people will suffer and die. It would be better if society were to decide, let's make a big push and put more resources into this thing because it, of course it will benefit all of us and people forever. The last thing I want to say is that uh, science is a social activity. Um, in July, uh, my, my uh, people who worked with me over the years had a birthday party for me. And uh, so here is a, a subset of the people who have worked with me over the last 50 years. Some of them are right here in New Haven. This fellow, Enrique de la Cruz, is a professor here at Yale. Uh, this fellow, uh, Julian Barrow, is also a professor here at Yale. These other people are professors and uh, journal editors and, uh, and uh, scientists at other places in the world. So you may have this idea that science, science is a, you know, a lonely activity, working by yourself in the lab, but it's not. It's a social activity, and uh, one of the nice things about a career like I've had is to be able to work with all these fantastic people who have gone on and expanded what we've had learned about cells moving. So thank you for coming. <laughs> to give away also if you filled out that registration card you registered for our drawing so any more questions for professor pollard right here and in cell movement or in voluntary actions is the cell membrane working with the brain and causing the cells to move Okay, this is Walker, correct? That's your name? Okay, good. He's got his name on his shirt. So I, Walker asked how the membrane participated in the cell division. Well, the membrane's really important because the, the, the ring, which is going to contract like a muscle, has to be attached to the membrane in order for the, to, uh, to bring the membrane into a tiny little spot where the membranes can fuse together and allow the two cells to separate. So it's an important part of the whole thing. And actually, the, how the, how the uh, contractile 
proteins are attached to the membrane is one of the things we know the least about. So if you wanted to have a good problem to work on when you were a scientist, you could try to figure that out. There's still plenty of great questions to be answered out here. Okay, this is a great question. This is a physics question about the, what the force is on the node. There's a lot of drag on the node. And as I just said, we don't actually understand exactly how they're attached to the membrane. But it, it's surely to do with the molecules they're attached to in the membrane. We think, but we don't know for sure, that there's a really big proteins in the membrane to which the nodes are attached. Okay, so if you want to pull on a node, there's actually quite a bit of drag. Uh, like I was, I had to pull hard to move uh, my friend over here. Uh, and that's what's resisting the motion. So if the, if the pulling stops, then the node stops and doesn't move. It has to wait till it gets captured by, a, you know, a, a, it captures another filament and can move around. That's great. Up there, I see a question. How did we do that? Yeah. Oh, we were horrible to these poor cells. We ground them up, OK? And that, that's interesting, because at the time, uh, most of the people who are interested in cell motility believe strongly that you should not do that, OK? Because they had this idea they, that there was something magical about a, a live cell that was required for it to move. So they figured, if you ground up the cell, and killed it, you kill it while you're grinding it up, that this magic would go away. And therefore, you couldn't possibly learn anything about how cells move if you ground up the cells as a first step in your experiment. This is uh, a funny, old-fashioned idea called vitalism, that there was something magic. But in fact, cells are just really complicated chemistry and physics. Okay. And so there's nothing magic about them. It's just really complicated chemical and physical reactions. So it is OK to grind up the cells as the first step in your experiment and try to get the molecules out of the cell. Because when you've got the molecules out of the cell, you can do certain, you can do things with them you can't possibly do inside of a living cell, like determine their structures. That was a great question. I'm glad you asked that. Did everybody catch on to that? So this, this is like a huge change in my field and in other areas of biology, too where people have stopped believing in magic and, and now actually believe that it's chemistry and physics, yes. So I teach computer science, and I'm curious for my students, um, do you have people on your team who are computer scientists first that are like the expert in making the models in addition to the biologists? OK, that's a great question. So if you're going to try to do this kind of work, which involves some physics and some chemistry and some math, and uh, some biology as well. You have to have people who are very versatile. And the, we do it all inside of one lab. Some of the labs do it by collaborations with another lab that's specialized, for example, to do mathematical modeling. But we try to do everything inside of the one lab so all the people can interact with each other, which may, is much more powerful than if they're in separate rooms or in separate buildings. Um, and so the people who come to my lab, I have a lot of different backgrounds. So for example, some of them have, have been uh, 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 theoretical physicists. Some of them have been applied mathematicians. Some of them have been physical chemists. Some of them have been biologists, <laughs> OK? And we all get together and share our expertise to uh, try to solve these problems. It, it's, it's not trivial to put together a group that can operate on such a broad uh, front, uh, but it, it's, it's very powerful if you can do it. Any others? Yeah. Yes, sir. So I remember you stated that the um, biological community has improved over the last 50 years. Yes. How do you feel that the biological community can improve over the next 50 years? Oh, I think, I think one of the, one of the, the big uh, challenges is for the community to um, take advantage of all the resources we have available. Mm -hmm. And I gave you examples of the main resources that have been valuable for us. Uh, there are not that many labs who, who take such a broad approach to things, but I'm convinced that if, if everybody did that, uh, we'd all make more progress. Uh, there's always new methods coming along. 
uh, and it's really hard to predict what they're going to be. There's some fantastic new microscopes that I didn't tell you about today that we use in our lab. Uh, and uh, they're very surprising because you can see much finer details than anybody would have imagined um, uh, 10 years ago or, or 30 years ago. Let's, or, let's, let's uh, pick a good time. 20 years ago, you could not have imagined seeing this level of detail. But some very clever physicists uh, who won a Nobel Prize for their work figured out how to make a better microscope to see finer details. And so those things are unpredictable. And so as well, added, I was going to ask you how, um, did any of your research ever tie into your medical practice or, um, at Harvard? Oh, the question is, what, what happened to my medical practice? Okay, so if you figured out I went to medical school, I don't have a PhD. Um, and so I spent a year uh, being a doctor, and then I got sidetracked because the fellow asked me the question about the, do I really believe there's actin and myosin in, in amoebas? I showed you the department chair. He uh, offered me a chance to become a basic scientist uh, because he got convinced we were on the right track. And I gave up my, my uh, clinical uh, uh, practice at that point and became a basic scientist. That was fairly common at the time. It's pretty uncommon now. But um, all of this has important implications for clinical medicine. I just don't happen to do that anymore. OK, thank you. Kurt. Thanks, Tom, again. Thank you.